Great. Why don't we go ahead and get started, everyone? Um, we'll give it a few more minutes as people join. Um, I'd like to welcome everyone for our to our second um, edition of the Principal Interest webinar series focusing on development finance. Um, my name is Sashi Jayatilika, and I am the team lead for the development finance workstream in the PSE Hub. And today we'll be discussing a little bit more about what mobile uh, property lending is and how it can be applied to your programs in the field. Um, we've got um, some distinguished panelists who have experienced both um, testing this model out here in the U.S., Canada, and in uh, countries overseas, and we'll be discussing how that works in terms of what it takes to move from um, the law that might be placed to actually enforcement and um, tactics that we can use to increase uptake from financial institutions. Um, We'll cover some examples first in Colombia, and then we'll move to Kenya, Indonesia, and Vietnam. Um, but please do feel free to ask any questions you might have in the chat box, as well as uh, you can send direct questions to participants if it's a specific question to a, uh, a panelist. Um, so with that, I, maybe we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, and I'd like to introduce our moderator today, um, Wayne Channel, who is our Senior Economic Growth Advisor for Gender at USAID. Welcome, Wade. Thank you. Great to be here. Um, I am. So, go ahead. No, no, please go ahead. Um, so, I mean, we're not going to be formal here, so I think I, I hope everyone does feel free to ask questions as you have them. And there is no such thing as a stupid question, especially because um, this uh, actually term has been used in many different forms, and so um, this slide actually illustrates that in that um, sometimes you might hear this referred to as what, mobile property lending, um, and so maybe, Wade, you can tell us a little bit about what it is and why it matters in our world. Yeah, glad to, and thanks for pointing out the confusion over the over the um terms because there has been uh, a lot of confusion over the years. We we talk about secured lending, which covers all lending where you have whether a mortgage or a pledge or whatever, and yet we mean secured lending usually refers in the United States to move, uh, proper, uh, lending that is um, secured by movable or intangible property. Uh, we use asset-backed lending, which most people think of mortgages, but it actually can also be movable and intangible property. Movable property lending, I think for many, is just easier to use, but you will see these terms thrown about all over all over the developing world and the, the consulting world, uh, frankly. What is it? Why does it matter? Well, the, the world financial systems have been built on mortgages, and those mortgages are based on the ownership um, or other long-term rights in real property, in houses and land and buildings, apartments, condos, et cetera, um, they don't move. So they're very secure. Banks need to know that when they lend money, first they want uh, they want two ways out. They want to know what the income is that's going to enable the, the borrower to repay the loan. But if something happens, and not, not, not necessarily something nefarious, the market tanks, COVID hits, suddenly your market dries up, you can't repay, Banks are not lending their own money. They're lending our money. They're lending depositors' money, and they have a very strong legal mandate to ensure that they get the money back and protect their depositors. So they want to know that if you can't pay them back, what are you going to give them that they can sell and pay themselves back? Um, it's been land for centuries. Uh, there have been other things, but today and for the past, oh, 70 years, there's been a growing use of all kinds of physical properties, inventory equipment, um, even things of goodwill, intangible properties, um, franchise rights, other things that, that can be actually pledged to pay back a loan. Uh, if it can't be sold, it doesn't work, but you know the basics are simple. It must exist now or in the future. It must have value to the banks through the market, and it must be enforceable. And we've seen tremendous growth um, in lending and capacity for people who don't have real estate to get loans through through this kind of lending. In fact, in the U.S., a, a factoid I saw some years ago was that 60% of commercial lending in the U.S. is based on a combination of, of inventory and receivables. Only 20% of commercial lending in the U.S. is based on real estate. In much of the developing world and, and the uh, places where we work, 
it's 80% or more is based on real estate. And so the lending systems are constrained by the ability of people to use real estate. So that's quite long. Um, I'll just mention how do you do this? Well, if the, the problem with movable property is that it can be moved. So fraud, fraud issues come up. And again, the banks have to know that they're safe. And there are the, the system that's been developed between the law and a registry is fantastic because you lend me money. Um, it is secured with my inventory. Um, somebody, and as soon as I get my loan, I call another bank and say, I want property. You know, I need a loan and I secure it with my inventory. And then I call the next and so on. That, that kind of fraud does happen. Um, but if I, if the claim is registered, the next lender can look online and say, whoa, 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 whoa. I'm not lending to you on this. You've already got a loan on this. You're overexposed. And it helps to create a much more stable, um, financial system, frankly, as well as, as broader. Great. I mean, maybe I can ask you a specific question. I see you've got a nice collection of guitars behind you. Um, yeah. If you would, how, what is the level of um, like, like size of collateral that one can place in in you, trying to use movable property? Could your whole collection of guitars, or does it have to be worth a certain amount if you're borrowing a certain amount? Well, in this case, you know, if we looked at these, let's say one of them was signed by Elvis and one of them came from Bono and then my Oud was part of college band. And, you know, these really had some, it, they would have to have some significant um, okay. actual value to be useful. Um, and that could be, I mean, people do, they, they do get loans against that kind of thing. But let's say this is a store that you're seeing behind me. So you're seeing one of my 500 instruments. What would actually happen is I wouldn't put a, a – no bank's going to give me a lien just on the Elvis guitar. They're going to give me a lien on the inventory, the entire value of it. And it will depend on banking regulations, experience, and my credit history, whether they'll give me a loan for, you know, 10% of that value or 50% of that value. Uh can vary a lot. So it's not written in stone what it will be. Other things, as we will see as we go through this, there's an ecosystem of lending – that is more than just whether you have movable property or more than whether you just have a mortgage on real estate. Um, but they would be tending to go for higher value and preferably multiple things, but a higher p value piece of equipment like a tractor, those are owned against all the time and highly movable. There's actually a, um, a protocol through UNCITRAL uh, worldwide on agricultural equipment and enabling agricultural um, lenders to know that if their equipment moves across a border, they can still get it if there's a default. Wow. Wow. So can you tell me a little bit, maybe this relates to this question about a collateral registry. Um, is there a collateral registry that's in each country and how is it monitored and and yeah. then finally, as you can see, the next question, which is, why hasn't there been greater uptake? So at this point, um, collateral registries, you know, once were paper registries and the physical, and countries still want to own their own collateral registry. The fact is we could have a Google form of, of, of collateral registry. It could be on servers and in the cloud and cover any country. That's not the case. There are sovereignty questions and, of course, lots of of uh, data protection questions that come in. So collateral registries now are seldom have a physical office that you need to go to. Um, those are still around in some places, but it tends to be very online. I point you to Bosnia. Uh, a few years back, it had one person full time, a quarter uh, a quarter time uh, computer analyst, a computer repair person, and they were uh, they were bringing in hundreds of thousands of dollars in loans uh, in in fees from the multiple small costed, costing um, registrations that took place. It, it's just a lot easier now. That said, um, it, yeah, it can be, I, this is my dream. I don't know if anyone's dreaming it with me, but check the Latin American, the Central American registries, check the Comesa registry, check something that t covers an entire region as opposed to going from one to another. That can happen. It hasn't happened yet today. They're all uh, pretty much individualized. On the uptake question, very interesting. I was at a conference in Mexico City a couple of years on secured lending, and we had a group there from Jamaica, and they were pointing out that they had a brand new law, excellent law, brand new registry, excellent registry, and nobody was using it. The issues are various, but one is that um, 
we're asking, we're setting up and working with banks to enable them to use something they've never done before. Banks are by law and nature very conservative, so they have to learn a lot of new new tools of the trade to achieve this. And Joe Heim is going to be talking this about this in a minute. Um, sometimes, I, you know, and we've seen countries where you don't have a lot of banks vying for a bigger position in the market. They're very happy. In many countries, they were set up by a small group of people to serve that small group of people, and they're still quite happy with it. But when you get growth orientation, you get an interest in figuring out how new ways to do loans. We have been promoting uh, this as a, a, an important means of women's access to finance. I work on gender issues and women's economic empowerment. And most women don't have access to real estate. This is very important to them for growth. Um, but they also represent a smaller market. Most women's firms are smaller. Most of their sales levels are smaller. Their assets are smaller. And some banks don't, it, it, it's just too costly for them. It doesn't fit into their into their a profit model or even their business model overall. So there are a number of issues here. And what we've been doing at AID over the past couple of years is trying to examine these. If it's a matter of how to do it, then let's move on and teach them how to do it. Great. Thanks, Wade. Well, I think um, I'm looking forward to hearing more about how this can be applied to actually expand lending to underserved populations. So why don't we move on and, and you can introduce our next panelist. Thank you. And that is a pleasure to do. I've, um, I have been working in secured lending for decades and love it. I, it's, I'm one of those people who's passionate about it. I can clear a party talking about this, and I've actually with a friend done that. But we'll, we'll, this party, I think, is much more interested. So uh, we have two people with us today who have been working with us to hit different areas. Joe Heim is new to my neighborhood in terms of we, we've only met recently, but Joe is a very well-recognized professional within the asset-based lending, movable property lending um, world. He works on field examination on how do you how do you figure out how much your collateral is worth. I come in like your question, um, Sashi. I want to use my guitar collection or my guitar inventory. How in the world is a bank supposed to know if that has any value or can be resold? So he is one of those people that that gets into the real grit of the system and can uh, can help banks with understanding all of this. Uh, Bar Pereg is with Deloitte, and well, uh, let me note, uh, Joe is with ABL Consulting Services of Dopkin and Company. Uh, Bar is with Deloitte, and Deloitte and I have been working through for about three or four years on issues in Colombia, in particular. Bar has been part of the team of late, and very welcome to have her here. Um, she comes with a commercial background, not a development background, which, of course, we're talking to banks and lenders. They don't speak development. They speak commerce. So it's always exciting when I get to work with somebody who I know doesn't have to translate to the banks and lenders and can help, uh, help us all understand better what we're trying to get here. And with that, let me stop talking, and I want to let Joe get going. Thank you, Wade, and thank you, Sashi. Welcome, everyone. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues at Dawkins & Company, I appreciate the opportunity to discuss different and unique approaches that advance financial inclusion in the context of uh, international development. Uh, in the next 10 minutes, uh, I hope you'll learn that there are three primary components that, when used in combination, will support an increase in financing alternatives and thereby the advancement of financial incl inclusion in the international development sphere. Uh, those three components are, and, and you might want to write this down, I'll refer to them often, um, you invest and engage with experienced industry professionals, you invest and engage key stakeholders and actors in the region, and third, you invest and engage in standardized tools consistent with international best practices. Um, you might interest you to know that our project with USAID in Colombia is a terrific example of investing and engaging experienced industry professionals like myself from the private sector. The objective of designing an asset-based lending framework in Colombia is to increase access to capital 
for women by expanding access to finance to the micro, small, and medium enterprises, SMEs, that have valuable movable assets, as we described, but no land or real estate to use as collateral. It's important to note that USAID chose Colombia, chose to focus on Colombia, because one, the government there has invested in instruments for secured financing, such as the registry for movable property. And two, the hypothesis is that creating this field examination framework for valuing movable property would catalyze acceptance and best practices from businesses to allow more asset-based lending loans to be made. Bringing our experience from the private sector, our role was to design a field examination framework to assist the lender in evaluating those assets pledged as loan collateral. That was the objective. Now, the second component, understanding the Colombian context, um, was also equally important. Uh, because of our vast experience of working with asset-based lenders in the U.S., Canada, and Europe, we knew the importance of understanding the Colombian context. We conducted meetings and interviews with key stakeholders and actors in Colombia to understand what the current environment was and acceptance for movable property lending and what obstacles could there be. Now, you might be wondering what lessons did we learn uh, throughout the project? Um, it was fascinating. We learned that the business ecosystem in Colombia was bringing mutually supportive firms together and making investments in new laws, regulations, and the creation of the National Public Registry. However, we saw that there was a gap between these fundamental elements and the real-world application of asset-based lending consistent with international best practices. We saw that technical expertise was needed to get the mechanisms working, and the deliverables from our project provide an effective framework, tools, and recommendations to assist the lenders in the implementation of movable property lending in Colombia. Good. I think we've still got one slide, and I know you have more slides than that, Joe. Um, just yeah, a little glitch there. Slide. There we go. Yeah, sure. So, so often I'm asked, you know, what are the challenges uh, to implement uh, to ABL or, or movable property lending, whether it's uh, within a specific bank or a region or a country? Um, five primary challenges that we see. One is market acceptance. With any product or service, is the market saturated with alternatives? Would the market accept it? Second, is there that ecosystem, that business ecosystem? Do you have collaboration around uh, movable property lending? Third, culture. Will the business community embrace the initiative? There could be some resistance in serving an underserved market, such as women-owned SMEs. Uh, SMEs may find uh, asset-based lending to be intrusive, the, the due diligence that takes place, or expensive. So you're saying that that cultural issue could be from both sides. It's that the, you know, we haven't lend, loaned to women, and only 10 years ago our country allowed women to sign a contract on their behalf, so we're sketchy. Or it's like, I don't need you in my books from the lender, uh, the borrower. They don't they don't want to put that up there. They may just be prefer to take smaller loans at yeah. higher rates, which is unusual, but people do that. Okay. Absolutely. So you may get resistance, certainly uh, on both sides, of obviously being a new, new product uh, being served to the market. And then the last two components is the banking and legal environment. You want to make sure that you have the appropriate laws and regulations. And then Fifth, you want to have good technical expertise, both in your banking, your accounting, uh, asset valuations, and the legal uh, community. Uh, next slide. And Wade, you recall we were heavily uh, uh, involved in uh, speaking with those key stakeholders and actors uh, in the region. Um, I feel that you really need the boots on the ground to provide you with an assessment of the potential obstacles 
in movable property lending. And if and you want yep. Well, that I want to point out here is if you look at this list, it's not it's a wide range here, including international organizations like IFC, uh, USAID, IBRD, EBRD, African Development Bank, et cetera. Many of these donor organizations as well are heavily involved in movable asset lending laws and regulations. But that's clearly not enough. We finance and bring expertise. If if you don't have the Colombian banking system in, interested, we're wasting our time. And, you know, likewise, uh, business people need to know about this. So I like how you've brought together, I think, a very important point, that this is a very large team sport, and we need a lot of players on this team to make it work. And that's what I found most impressive, that the government and industry trade groups in Colombia – that built this uh, robust business uh, ecosystem to create the policies and procedures. One relationship I like to highlight is uh, the relationship with the International Finance Corporation. Uh, if we go back to the slide, um, our collaboration was, uh, with IFC was critical in understanding the Colombian context, as well as validating the tools uh, and materials that we were developing. Um, the IFC reviewed our technical work product providing us with critical feedback uh, so th those deliverables could be uh, uh, implemented effectively. And lastly, we relied on our alliance partner, RSM, a global accounting firm that has offices in Colombia. They played a critical role in helping us understand the Colombian marketplace, as well as translating our deliverables into Spanish so that they could be immediately implemented. Great, great. Next slide. So, Wade, you and I talked about this as well, where um, I think people will find that Colombia is an excellent example of a country that has implemented secured transaction laws and simplified corporation laws that have created instruments such as the public registry, electronic invoices, and asset valuations. These in instruments and others support the lender in the validation and the eligibility of that criteria of the collateral that's being pledged uh, uh, against the uh, movable property loan. And again, there was this gap uh, that existed between the policies and procedures that, that have been developed through this collaboration and actual implementation. So technical expertise was needed to get these mechanisms working, uh, and that's where we played a, a, an important role. Yeah, and I like that. I want to just emphasize that again here. There are a number of things that are showing up here that have been important to the system. And there's been a lot of excitement both inside Colombia and those of us who work on these issues about Colombia because it's really set up to move in this way. But there have been some um, – the roadblock, the simple roadblock of this is new. No one's ever done this before. How do we do it? So, Joe, why don't you tell us how you are helping to address that? Yeah, this next slide, um, we, we, we came on board to uh, design a field examination framework. As Wade pointed out earlier, fraud does exist in the system. You could have a borrower who would pledge their inventory to three lenders. So a field examination is a key mechanism used by banks and financial institutions to value, monitor, and control the eligible uh, collateral. And the way we do that is through a field examination where we go on site and we examine the borrower's books and records. We do an inspection. Um, with that field examination requires training. So we designed a field examination handbook that outlines the step-by-step -step instructions for a field examination, including checklists, policies, and templates. What also is important is to provide a template to do the testing and report the recommendations, and that's where we uh, put together the work paper report template. And then lastly, um, we identified firms in Colombia that would be capable of performing the uh, field examinations. Now, with all those tools, there's one more component left, and that will be training. Our advice to all the stakeholders uh, involved in the project is that experienced professionals should assist those on, in the ground uh, uh, with the implementation of, of, of a field examiner uh, framework. 
and there's schools that, that we are involved in that, that do that as well. And I appreciate this. You know, one of the, there's a question that came in while you were talking about uh, enforcement, and we're not going to get into that here, but, you know, how do you enforce these loans, et cetera? That's, that's an incredibly important question. Maybe that's a future webinar. But one of the things that I love about movable property lending is that it lowers the risk to the borrower of loss. They don't lose their land. When they have, when it, they get a piece of equipment, a loan on it, they can't pay it back for whatever they have, they lose their equipment, which is, is a shame, but they still have their land. When I see uh, pushing mortgage lending out to the poor, which is highly risky, they're poor because they don't have resources. When they go bankrupt, when they can't pay, they lose their land. It becomes homelessness, not just uh, a mortgage. They, they don't have anything left. And I think, one of the things that really sells me on movable property lending, especially as we go down the the pyramid into people who have less, um, le who should not be mortgaging their land, it gives a whole new opportunity. Um, with that next slide, and I may, I actually may take sort of moderator approach here and and just say, I think these are very straightforward. You see these. I, I want to move on to bar because I know I talk too much, so I've already cost us some time, which is, I'm now stealing from you, Joe, and uh, apologies, public apologies for that. No, but, no. You know, the, I, like, I like what you put together here. You, you, there's a system here. It's not, oh, well, you've got a law. Great. Well, you know, that's nice. That's, you have to have a structured discipline approach that takes time. Um, you can set up a secured lending system the law and the registry in a year, but that doesn't mean anybody's going to use it. So taking your time to do it right, to bring people in, to look at the other policies that support or do not, enforcement being one of them that somebody, if you can't enforce against it, you won't lend against it. So it's just theoretical opportunity. Um, and this uh, issue of using the various professionals on the ground, as you said, accounting firms and lawyers and bankers, uh, financial specialists, um, evaluators, there's quite a group out there, and most most places have these. They just haven't been asked to do this before. So that's part of the training and approach that uh, we're wanting to continue doing. Yeah, well, I, I would last point I'd make is that um, with these recommendations and the approach that we outlined, using experienced professionals, uh, actors on the ground, and the tools, I'm sure members of our audience can see that this process can be replicated relatively simple. Now, I. I that put that in quotes, uh, in other international uh, developing markets. Thank you. Then, yes, thank you very much for that, because this is not about Colombia per se. This is about the entire system and what are the opportunities worldwide. And frankly, there are a lot of opportunities worldwide, and, and we'd love to continue to support those. With that, I want to thank you, and I want to turn it over to Barr. I'm not going to reintroduce you, Barr. She's with Deloitte. No she's name. commercial. She knows what she's doing. <laughs> Go for it. Can you hear me all right, Wade? Yes. Excellent. Wonderful. So thank you so much. Uh, really excited to be here today. And I'm going to talk about our program that really is kind of built on the insights and learning from the past few years we've been working with Agenda uh, on this topic. Uh, consulted with experts like Joe and, and really trying to tackle the, the point that Wade made earlier, this is new, how can we make it work? Recognizing that there is all these barriers, um, how can we drive the market acceptance? Um, so taking a step back, our program uh, for the past over six months now has focused on two goals. One, Assessing the viability of MPL, movable property lending, in additional USA uh, present countries. So basically, is it a good business, right? Should bank offer MPL? Will they make money out of it in other countries? The second goal was to assess whether we can incentivize financial institutions to do more MPL using blended finance. Right, the logic here is that if MPL can be a good business for banks, for fintechs, et cetera, and they're not doing it, we should be able to find finance provider and investors, a funder, et cetera, that will be willing to take the risk in order to get the reward. The two goals, assessing the viability, viability in additional countries and checking the option to introduce blended finance as a way to move the market, to push a financial institution in this direction. Um, and 
what we've done, we first chose a small subset of countries where we believe that A, MPL is possible, right? It's not completely impossible due to enabling condition, which Joe talked about just a second ago. We were looking for countries where there is a financial system that can um, support such uh, transactions. So there are enough or at least some financial institutions that are willing and able to do such work uh, to offer this type of products. And three, we were looking for countries where the learnings and the impact will be worth the effort. We were looking for a selection of countries that has different characteristics that we can apply to more countries. And we're looking for countries that has a sizable challenge. Um, and that's led us to uh, choose Kenya, Indonesia, and Vietnam. And when you, within these countries, we've conducted a thorough market study to understand the barriers and opportunities, assess the viability, but also to connect the dots and to find and connect opportunities for these blended finance transactions. So we've kind of took a learning and doing approach um, to not only learn, but also see if we can influence the market and make transaction actually happening. Um, last process thing I'll say is that we are a team of both development and commercial practitioners, right? So we, uh, way said before, at the end of the day, it's banks and, and financial institutions that needs to change their behavior if this thing will ever succeed. So we've kind of blended our own team so we're able to have both development practitioners, commercial practitioners, and people in the bridge of in-between like myself that I work both with companies and um, public institutions. So next slide presents our analytical framework. So as I mentioned, we did a, a, a thorough market study on these three countries that included a lot of research and conversation with experts, uh, but also many interviews with financial institutions on the ground, basically asking them, are you offering MPL? What type? Why? Why not? What, do you, what needs to happen for you to do it, et cetera? And, um, and after listening to all of them and, and kind of synthesizing the learning, we realized that we can organize the factors that drive the um, viability of MPL into two frameworks. On the left, ecosystem factors. These will be, sound pretty familiar for us that working in the development space. Um, all these buckets that explain to what extent is the financial system and the system in all is open to adopt such things. Specifically for MPL, we have um, things, if we take, for example, first bucket enabling condition, um, both Joe and we talk to this collateral registry. If a country does not have collateral registry or it's not really well functioning, it's gonna be really hard to do MPL. Um, if we look at the second bucket, the finance provider intermediaries, this is the extent in which the financial system is developed and working and diverse and competitive, right? So if we take our countries, for example, in a place like, um, Vietnam, there is a lot of asset, a lot of state-owned banks, um, which kind of influence the way that they are making their decision and allocating their finance. In Indonesia, for example, there is a boom of fintech players that are now racing to the market, increasing all those new opportunities. All these factors are really influencing how MPL is possible and or viable. Now, if you think about all those ecosystem factors, and in general, when we assess ecosystems, this does not mean that a specific bank is able or not able to offer NPL. It means that it will affect the extent of which it will be popular. On the right, we see the transaction factors, which is a little bit more new when we think about development practices. On the right, this framework explains, will a bank or a financial a non-bank financial institution will choose to offer a product or service? And the answer is, well, it really depends on the green plate, right? If this product is able to offer profit, then they will probably go for it. That's the very simple for profit logic. Now, in and order while you, to while you've been, I just wanted to know while you've been speaking, we had a really good question come in on this. I go, these, all this field examination and such comes at a cost. And in fact, the cost in the rural areas may be so high that you could make it profitable, but the interest rates are going to be so high, nobody wants it. And that's one of the issues we have here. That profit is basically we're looking at the um, at the ability of them to earn a decent competitive uh, uh, profit margin on high rates. Yeah, that's not going to work so well. You know we, what we're looking at, and this is for another webinar. Looking at all of these uh, costs in here, 
That's part of what we're looking at. And one of the costs that's being done here is the risk by having the MPL as your collateral. But anyway, let me go back to you. I just thought it was interesting that as you were talking, yeah, somebody yeah. posted a question on on the uh, this whole cost thing. If it's not profitable, it doesn't happen. You know, we know that microfinance interest rates are very high because you have to recover your costs, and it's expensive to put out a small loan. It's expensive to put out a large loan, but a large loan can cover it. Yeah, and, yeah. and I think it's a great point, Dwight, because at the end of the day. We're trying to understand, will banks go for it? Will we able to get the private sectors to play like we want them to play in favor of the development agenda? And the answer is, well, it depends if it's worth it for them. And it's true that specifically for MPL, the costs are really high compared to just, you know, issue a non-secure loan. And we've heard in our conversation exactly that point about the question, you know, it's, <clears throat> it's too expensive. You know, Indonesia is really big, so we can't really assess the credit of every single farmer. So this is all true, and that's a huge barrier, but what we're doing here is we're unpacking this big, it's expensive argument into cost drivers. This will help us understand which of these cost drivers we can mitigate and which of these NPL opportunities will actually create profit, right? Because the insight here, the big kind of learning is that NPL is not the answer for every single loan product, for every single customer in across the world. NPL, is working when a specific market situation occurs. And this cost pricing stack helps us understand where can it happen. So for example, if we take you know, transaction costs, it's, it's, we talked about guitars, uh, wait, we're sticking with your guitar collection, it's really expensive to assess how much a guitar costs or to understand how much we can sell it in the market. Um, we also need to check Wade's reputation, which you know, also a process that we have to go through. So all of these and understanding these in the context of MPL or any other type of intervention is really critical for us as development agenda practitioners when we go to the private sector. And what it helps us do is think about how to mitigate the cost or basically answer the question that we just you know, surfaced. How can we make it profitable even if it's really rural? Let's move to the next slide. Because the bright side is that we have seen this work. We've seen instances of MPL adopted, used successfully. We've also seen the places where we felt like it could have worked, right? We felt like it's, it's only dot, 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 that would totally work and we could protect this green profit place for the companies for them to choose to in, in, engage. And the three buckets of tactics that we found working is one, MPL tactics, which I'll talk in a second in more um, detail. Second is inclusive finance tactics, broadly speaking. And I think we all kind of saw these type of tactics in use, but they are especially um, uh, positive or helpful in this context of MPL. Things like um, leveraging anchor companies. So if I provide supply chain financing to a small shop owner, I will have some kind of uh, uh, commitment uh, from a, a, a larger distributor. So think about a Unilever, provide their inventory as a collateral to a small small shop. So that helped me not just use the inventory as collateral, but also the promise from a big, big company. So that's just a, a number of inclusive finance tactics that I think um, most of us have, have seen. The other is around blended finance tactic or like incentive structure that helps kind of influence those financial institutions. I'll just give one example. Um, um, the the third one, increasing for profit transaction. Um, we've seen a really interesting case of a foundation collaborating with a bank to basically offer more profit if they win. So basically the foundation has put half of the loan principal with the bank, but not taking any interest. So if the bank is doing it well, they're getting double the interest. So instead of mitigating the risk, which we see a lot in the space, we can actually also amplify the profit. So these are kind of like a generic, uh, tactics, but that we saw very helpful in MPL. Uh, but in the next slide, we talk about the specific tactics that helped address the cost of, of the, the high cost of MPL, which, again, what we talked about with the pricing stack. The, the, as we said, kind of like the, the biggest cost, what jumps to everyone is the asset valuation and the asset repossession. And one of the things we saw that was very helpful is asset specialization, right? If, uh, if Wade is coming to the bank with his guitars and the day after I come after with my um, pictures collection and, and then Joe comes with um, his ties, the bank has to relearn how to assess 
um, cost and how to reassess reposition. But if the bank says, listen, I'm going to focus on one type or two types of assets, and I'm going to have a system and a mechanism to assess them, then they're able to have a better, um, a better unit economics. Uh, example we've seen is, um, um, is actually a company that only do solar, solar pumps for farmers in Zambia. And this one type of solar pump is all they do. So they're so professional in how it works that it's almost a uh, negligible cost to, um, to assess and value it, et cetera. So asset specialization is really, um, is a game changer. Um, then we have lending for productive assets. Um, and I'm, I'm actually gonna jump just looking at the clock. Um, someone asked in the chat box about repossession. So um, the third tactic um, we've identified is actually some companies or some financial institutions are able to embed the repossession into the operation. So think about a platform that have um, the, um, a small business inventory on the line, some kind of a FinTech solution that enable you as the lender to have access to the inventory or to future payment, et cetera. So that that you don't even need to go and repossess. You don't need to claim something. It's part of the operation automatically, right? So this is just one example of how technology can help with repossession and making it cheaper, less dramatic, um, and reduce the risk. Um, so again, four example of tactics for MPL that we've learned um, that help us understand not if MPL is profitable or not, because it will be profitable when such tactics are in place or when the, the system is um, providing the, you know, is able to, to make it viable. So this is kind of the lesson learned, the insights, which is great, but just to remind you all, our goal was to kind of learn the viability, but also to check if we can influence uptake using blended finance. So using all those conversations, um, we've actually prioritized a small subset of financial institutions, and next I thank you, um, that are able they have the capability, and Joe talked about the complexity of issuing an MPL product. So these organizations have the capability, we believe in them, um, and they're also willing. They want to increase their SME portfolio, their women-owned portfolio, um, and, and after kind of, and again, those are like the diamonds in, in that we, we found, um, and we've surfaced them, and we've started to talk to them about, okay, so how can we increase MPL? What do you need? What type of funding? What are you going to do with it, et cetera? And we've created this eight opportunities for investment um, in companies. Now, if you look, these are very different types of uh, financial institutions. Some are commercial banks, some are small fintechs, um, and also the investment desire in some cases just increase the operation, and in other cases it's just a specific program. So. Um, it, we one bank, commercial bank in, in Kenya, really big bank, says like, I want to do women-owned SMEs, but it's just really hard for me to find the fuel, the capital. So I would gladly take an, an investment that will help me scope a program focusing on women-owned businesses. In the other case, we have a, a, a marketplace for farmers in, in Indonesia that says, listen, I I want to increase my um, I want to increase my loan. Um, so far, this this uh, startup is only providing loan against input and um, um, you know inventory of farmers, but they're happy to expand to machinery. But they need more fuel for that. They need more money, so they will seek investments specifically to move into assets from inventory. So these are the type of program we've scoped together with um, with this, with this institutions. And the last thing I'll say is that then we took this kind of portfolio. Uh, we did some due diligence and some kind of unpacking, and we went back to the investors and founders that we've talked to in the next slide in the beginning of the program, right? We've talked to all these players, some of them were investors, and we're back to be like, okay, we talked six months ago about this thing, will you be interested in investing in companies that we have found and we believe in? And um, this is pretty early stage. Uh, it's, we just started to kind of like go back and connect these dots in the past um, couple of months. But so far, we've been positively surprised with the amount of traction and interest and discussion going on. And it's really, um, especially with COVID, we really didn't expect the traction and, and we're really looking forward for the next few months to understand, okay, what is actually going to, who's going to ring the bell? <laughs> Are we actually going to have a transaction that's 
in kind of like support um, this or, or will it take, you know, more time? And that will be another layer of learning of how to incentivize this type of, um, of transactions. Um, so that's kind of the program as we go. Um, mm -hmm. I'm looking at the clock. I know it's 946. Yeah. No, thank you, Bob. This is really, really helpful. And I just want to reiterate that everyone, um, all your questions will be answered um, either with the remaining 14 minutes or we will be um, posing them to our panelists and writing it up into market links. But I think, Bar, like a question that seems to be coming up quite a bit is, around, you know, what you do to move beyond the, the banks. And it sounds like you're getting to that right now with the lessons learned here. Could you go over what some of the key things we should keep in mind in terms of moving beyond the actual product and the enforcement of the law into, into thinking through how to surface new opportunities? Sorry, so just to make sure I understand. So the question is how to push on to create more of such opportunities in the in the commercial space. Exactly. Yeah, especially given that we have the law in place in some countries. Yeah. And you know, mm -hmm. so we're, just the question is like how do how do our partners and how do we as USAID um, incentivize behavior change in these private firms? And what what are some tactics yeah. that, that we found we could we could do? Yeah, well that's my favorite question of all. Um, because <laughs> I think that I, I think that um I think it's such an important thing to understand to change the perception of private sector and understand private sector companies want to make profit. If possible, most of them would want to make a clean, responsible, inclusive, sustainable profit. But if they're not making profit, they don't have the legitimacy to go on. And we, and this is not a bad thing. This is how it works. So understanding to shift the mindset and really develop the empathy of how can we help these companies make money. And that requires us to understand how they're making money. What is the cost structure? What creates their profit? What changes can we do as development practitioners, policy shapers, to make it easier for them to make money? And then, if possible, to prioritize the companies that are as aligned as possible with development agenda. But it's really challenging to come to a company with a really good proposition to drive inclusive finance, but if there is no clear bottom line for them, it's going to be very short-lived, if at all, and in the long term will create skepticism that is not just not helpful, but in the long run will even create more and more challenges. So finding the way to change the mindset and, and really understand how they make money and kind of support that, um, I think that would be um, – uh, one, and the second one is, is about understanding the value that we have as development to the private sector, right? Uh, a, a New York-based banker does not have the ability to uh, assess opportunities in Bali. It's just too far and too expensive. But we have this network of thinkers, you know, um, and, and operations. And if we know how to partner together, if we think about what value we can provide to them in terms of information, ease of doing business, et cetera, we're able to help drive their profit and we can help them do their work better. So kind of understanding the role that development can play, I think I think that's key as well. Thank you. Go ahead, Sasha. Well, I was just gonna ask a follow-up question and, and Wade, this is kind of to you as well, actually, because um, from Barr's experience and Joe's experience, it sounds like they have a lot of commercial experience in the US and Canada. Oh, goodness, you froze. All right, Sashi froze. I think I saw this question, so I'll start while she's defreezing. Um, the, the, what's interesting here, there are certain basics that apply throughout different countries, evaluation and so on. The laws and regs change, um, and they change in various ways that affect the pricing. Again, all of this gets down to what is the risk to the bank and the cost to the bank that can be bundled together sufficiently to put out an affordable loan. Like in many countries, access to affordable lending, in fact, isn't possible. It's not even legal because there are so many risks to be covered that they have to be covered by the interest rate. But um, the various companies that we have worked with, the consultants, there's a, an excellent community of international consultants addressing many of these different issues. Uh, as you've seen with Joe, asset-backed lending is what he and his folks do for a living and they know how to apply these principles elsewhere. It's 
again, there will be laws that will affect something or other, but valuation is a valuation issue. Um, market valuation is um, is fairly fairly well. Well, I take that back. I can remember living in a country where their market valuation for houses was uh, they took the square footage multiplied by the cost of cement, and that was the market. Uh, so the one next to the toxic waste dump and the one overlooking the most beautiful lake in the world were valued the same if they were the same size. We know not everybody gets this, but we have people who get this and help can help uh, banks and other lenders move forward. I, I just want to throw in one thing here that hasn't come up. Um, we have emphasized banks a lot, but non-banking financial institutions have a little more flexibility here. They don't have the same requirements under um, prudential banking regulations and so on. They can offer this. They can offer secured lending. Uh, businesses that, that put forward, you know, for example, uh, a business that supplies to construction, co construction folks, they sell them uh, whatever, that they can actually get secured lending and lower their risk. Anyone that's putting, putting out credit to people, meaning pay us in 90 days. If they need, if it lowers their, their costs and their risks, they can use this. And the cost of registration should never be more than 10 or $15. It is not a way of raising money for the government. It is a way of growing the economy. And every time we've seen somebody put it as a percentage of the cost of the, of the loan, some countries have destroyed their secured lending by wanting a percentage of the loan. That's just. I get the. Under, I understand that. It it is a killer. It takes out the secured lending system and throws it into a, a much less efficient market. Great. And wait, just, just jumping in for a second. Um, just a just a wanted to say that one of our deliverable of this project has been really kind of to unpack the opportunities and people and folks on the ground doing this work. So if anyone here is looking in a specific country, we're more than happy to share the contact, the people, the organization, just in case it's helpful. So feel free to reach out to me afterwards and we're happy to share the, the actual people names. Sorry. No, thank you, Barb. That's a great point. And I think just to highlight um, part of my question is also on that exact point is how can we leverage all of what we've learned in uh, this type of work in the U.S. and Canada in our overseas market. It clearly means that uh, we have a blending of two worlds, the development community and those of us working in the, those of you working in this in, in the U.S. And so finding ways to partner is important. And I, I just wanted to highlight that, you know, we are looking at better ways of engaging with the private sector, and that is part of our private sector engagement policy. Um, we have uh, the Finance and Investment Network, which invests and catalyze run, and those are one, one way of engaging with new partners. And I think just for missions and implementing partners on the call, you know, it is sometimes looking outside our toolbox and bringing in know-how, but also applying it with our development context is important. And then finally, um, maybe this is on the next slide so we can move on to, to get a little bit more of a, the path forward. And, and um, I don't know if Bar or Wade, you want to summarize this so that we get an understanding of kind of the ecosystem here and, and how different actors can play different roles in, in enabling us to get to scale with um, asset-based lending. Well, Bar put this together, so I'm going to let her talk us through it. Sure. And, and in just really short, you know, what we think the path forward is really thinking about private sector investment as a first resort, but we're trying to en enable something that should work on its own. So as a development kind of with the mindset of like, let's understand how can we make it profitable, sustainable, and if needed, we can use blended finance to kind of help make it more um, attractive. Um, and then really, really zeroing on geographic understanding, Joe explained how important it is to understand the different factors of every country to be able to mitigate these and to develop the capability in the specific market. So us, each of us in our own geography really understand those moving factors and how can we influence them. Um, then recognizing there is a huge risk and, and way to talk to, to the big risk and understand how can we do risk? How can we help our private sector colleagues feel less worried about investing in their uh, money in those, and whether it's a de-risking measures with the, the DFCs or any kind of technical support we can assist or any kind of um, work we can do for them, uh, like identifying opportunities, et cetera, that will create kind of like aligned vision. Um, 
and then lastly, you know, optimizing the transaction um, and, and really push to create the, the facilities and the platform that makes this um, inclusive finance more transparent, profitable, legitimate, et cetera. Uh, so these are kind of like the four pillars that, that we have summarized. Um, uh, but yeah, Wei, Joe, any, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, uh, I, I would just want to echo the comments that were made earlier about uh, the non-bank uh, commercial finance companies. We've definitely seen an increase in that, and I think that's where this intersection of the private sector, they recognize that it's profitable. There's less regulation than some of the banks uh, are, are, are under, and therefore can uh, put together a really competitive uh, product structure alone that really benefits the borrower at a price that uh, – obviously makes money for the commercial finance company, but is also affordable for the borrower. Um, we have a question come in that I thought is, is a good one. And Wade, you sort of answered a part of this in, in, in the question regarding um, how technology can be used. But the question is, in certain countries where machines are not owned or registered in the name of the borrower, um, and that could be male or female, how and are there ways that um, banks can finance um, the procurement of, of big ag machinery, um, and are there ways of using behavioral finance or blockchain um, as a form of, of determining movable property? And, and, I, and I know this is a little nuanced, but I, I think it's a good question for us to think about in the context of agriculture. Well, I, I love the question, or I love some of the questions. Some of it I, I can't answer, so I don't love that part. You know, blockchain, that's not me. Um, it is being used uh, increasingly, and I don't know, I don't understand how. I, you know, there's only so much I can learn in a month. Um, but in terms of one of the interesting things about secured lending on movable property is you don't necessarily have to own it. There are many situations in which you just have to have an enforceable right to use the property and you can give up, you know, you can pledge that right in case of non-payment that your ability to use the property can then be taken and, and, and um, essentially sold to or given to someone else and removed from you. It's, um, it's a little more complicated, of course, but it's there. It's, it's one of the options. Um, the equipment... Large equipment is normally registered. Smaller equipment, a rice hus shelling machine, probably not a tractor in most countries will be registered. And, of course, the r registered owner will have to give permission for this loan, this, this to take place in many of the settings. Um, the registration is protection for everyone in this sense, and it also – interestingly, is a behavioral change. We saw this in Albania 20 years ago. People started registering their, they, they got secured lending, the bank registered a lien on their property. And even though it was questionable how good the enforcement system was, people realized this is public, this is serious, I have to pay this back, I can't play around with this. We have actually seen registration of an interest uh, against someone's property move their payment behavior up the scale because uh, a couple of reasons. One is the perception that it's public and they want to maintain their own public reputation and they begin to understand they maintain their credit rating if they pay it back. But two is they become very clear that non-payment means loss. And many countries have not had that, you know, as, as we've gone through various forms of government where banks were used more to fund friends than to make commercial loans. Um, this is helping to clean it up and helping to create a, a gap or fill a gap in the credit registration systems that may not be up yet. I'm still not Thank sure I answered everything. It was a very complicated question, but um, hopefully that helped. Well, and I'll give Joe and Barr a chance maybe on the written format. I know we're at 10 o'clock. I think it's a good question. I think the other question that came up at the end here is how to change behavior when women and underserved populations are risk averse. And that is, you know, the, the crux of this is that even if you have everything in place in laws and even if you can incentivize a bank, how do you incentivize um, the client to believe that this is actually possible? And so I think, you know, there's more to uncover. I think um, we can definitely discuss further in, in additional um, webinars, but if everyone is interested in learning more, there are some links here on the right-hand side that go into a little bit more about 
each of these presentations, how it worked, and then um, more examples from the field of what asset-based lending is, including um, models from, from the UN as well as a primer. And then you have Joe and Barr's email here, um, and I'm going to put Wade's email as well up here and on the chat box so you can reach him as well. And and really, you know, this is a, a point of discussion to say we haven't solved the, the solution with just uh, the problem by putting laws in place. We need behavior change and, and creative tactics of incentivizing private sector actors to enter the market. And so we welcome other people's suggestions and thoughts on how they've seen this work in the field. And um, while we didn't get enough time to get into all of that today, I hope that you'll um, take the poll at the end of this session and then give us your feedback on additional topics for our webinars. And we'll try to answer any questions we didn't get to today in the um, blog that will be posted uh, later this week. Thank you all for joining, Wade, Joe, and Barr. Um, and I hope um, the, and the audience that joined from wherever you are in the world, we really appreciate it. And thanks for your for time today. Our pleasure. Thank you, Sasha. Yep. Thank you very much.